Eight forty twenty before nine o'clock. I want to welcome uh, to the program live from uh, Jersey this morning. I guess uh, this is John Crowley. How are you this morning, John? I'm great, Roland. How are you? Wonderful. Now this weekend the uh, the movie Extraordinary Measures came out, a movie which is based uh, back towards uh, your book and your own personal family life experiences. Is that correct, John? Uh, that's right. It's, uh, the movie is inspired by our lives, Extraordinary Measures, and uh, by a book written uh, called The Cure by Gita Anand. And uh, our you... book uh, just coming out now is Chasing Miracles, which is our personal memoir, and kind of kind of role in our life perspectives and experiences and everything we've learned throughout all this journey of the last twelve years with our kids. Well, let's talk about that. Your your kids, uh, and, and how many kids are we talking about in the uh, Crowley family? We have three children. We have John, Megan, and Patrick. And now, th- th- did all three of them, or or was it just two of them that suffered from uh, this uh, this strange w- rare disease? Our youngest two, Megan and Patrick, were diagnosed. In 1998, actually out in California, we were living in Walnut Creek, California at the time, and Megan was 15 months old. Patrick uh, was just born in March of 98, and we were told that they were uh, would suffer from a disease called Pompe disease, which is a rare form of a muscular dystrophy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, very severe disease. We were told at the time they wouldn't live to be two years old. And, uh, you know, now they're 13 and 12, so we've come a long way. The journey is such, and, and, and thus your, your memoirs and the books and the movies all uh, cr- uh, chronicling this, uh, you had a chance to uh, to try to move it along a little faster because a lot of people weren't giving you a lot of hope. Is that right? That's right. I think more than anything, Roland, what we tried to do is to play a role in this and helping to raise money for research and awareness and then ultimately stepping aside from a job I had for about two years just out of grad school in the pharmaceutical industry and in a marketing department to step up as CEO of a small startup biotechnology company that was working on some really neat technologies that could apply to to this Pompeii disease. And through all of that, did that make a difference? I mean, were things elevated, uh, you know, in, in or accelerated in uh, the um, diagnosis and, and, and hopefully treatment of, of this Pompeii disease? I think so. You know, we went from those first two years of moving from the shock and the grief very, very quickly toward determination to helping to start that company in, in early 2000, eventually selling it to a much larger company in 2001 and running their Pompeii disease drug program. And now, uh, you know, by January of '03, Megan and Patrick received a life-saving enzyme replacement therapy that we played a role in developing, and that reversed the enlargement of their hearts, and that was the most life-threatening aspect of the disease for the kids. And now, you know, they're in seventh and sixth grades, and they've got hopes and dreams. And Megan is already talking about where she's going to go to college and what her wedding will be like someday. And, uh, you know, they're still very special kids, uh, but they they also have remarkably special gifts. Now, I didn't get a chance to see the movie this weekend, but I I, I got the hint that the the drug company and and the company that's a startup company that you got involved with and that got sold out to the bigger company kind of was uh, portrayed to be the uh, bad guy, you know, uh, big business and so forth. Is is that something you actually experienced in uh, your actual uh, timeline there? No, you know, I don't think there is a bad guy in the movie. I think the disease is the bad guy. I think what it shows is the complexities, the difficulties, the frustration that a lot of people have. And yes, I had to move from a small startup, very entrepreneurial, creative company to a larger one that was more process-driven and had to shift from moving from one environment to the other very quickly. So that tension, it shows the tension between business and science that exists really in every biotechnology and pharmaceutical company, but it also shows the mutual respect and reliance you need on one another to make these medicines real and, and to bring them to people who so desperately need them. Now, this is a disease I've never heard of beforehand, and there's a lot of diseases out there like that. Yeah. How, how, how many kids are affected in the world with Pompe d- disease? There are about five to 10,000 people with Pompe disease. It affects people from early childhood all the way through adult forms of the disease. And, you know, again, with five to 10,000 people, it's still considered a very rare disease, and it's one of 7,000 rare diseases that just in the United States affect more than 30 million people altogether. Now, so that's a, a you know a remarkable number of people who still need their own miracles and cures. 
Well, and, and people don't realize that, uh, you know, biz, uh, medicine is business. And so and you say five or 10,000 sounds like a lot, but as we look at a lot of uh, diseases, it's a small number. Are there businesses, uh, medical businesses that look and go, you know, it's just not profitable to chase a cure for that. Did you run into that? In the beginning, yes. And that was part of what we had to overcome to showing, you know, how you can actually develop a business model to develop a drug that would become profitable and that would justify the investment of what became hundreds of millions of dollars to develop this drug. Uh, and that's part of the challenge is you get into the really rare diseases. You know, 6,000 of those 7,000 rare disorders, Roland, affect fewer than 1,000 people. Wow. So, uh, you know, very, very difficult. Let me ask you this, because we're running out of time here. Um, your life was all focused and encumbered in, in fighting the, the disease and finding a cure. Have you had a chance for it to relax a little bit and expand beyond that, enjoy some other aspects of life now? And I think that's part of why we wrote Chasing Miracles. Even the title itself, again, has that double meaning. Yes, it's Chasing Miracles treatments and cures and all the work that goes into that. But eventually it became realizing that Megan and Patrick are our own miracles. And they live life with such incredible joy and zest and enthusiasm. And they zip around in their wheelchairs and they have those hopes and dreams. And we chase them every day. And they're the center of our lives. So it's chasing miracles in, in many respects. And that's really why we wrote the book, too, is to try to convey to so many people all the perspectives that we've drawn from all of our experiences in life. And, you know, if, if that can help other people become inspired and to learn and live a better life from all that our family has witnessed, lived, and come to understand, then I think that's part of the gift in all of this. All right. Thank you very much for sharing this morning. The uh, book is called Chasing Miracles. Uh, John, uh, good job and uh, keep up the good work uh, as a parent and, uh, and all that you uh, you know give to life here. We appreciate keep it. Keep fighting and living. All right. Thank you, all John. Best. Okay. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.